Father, we thank you for the privilege of being in your house. We thank you for a room filled with people that have chosen to be here this Friday night where they could have been anywhere else. And Lord, we just ask that no matter how we came in, that you would now deal with our hearts to be postured in a way in which you would be blessed and that we would be blessed in return. Lord, we believe that you have a word for us tonight, a word that would get so deep inside that it would change us. And so we pray that as your word goes forth, every other voice would be muted. Every other distraction would be destroyed. And that, Lord, you would receive preeminence. And that, Lord, your son, Jesus, would be high and lifted up, as we just sang, exalted in our sight. Give us the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Give us the empowerment that comes from him to take this word and for it to go from just a message to transformational. We need you desperately, Lord. We believe that people here, every single person needs you. And so we lean upon you and we ask that you would come strong. In your name we pray, amen. Forgive me, Gorgis, I'm going to have to take this. This whole week, just praying into this night, we're still in Isaiah. I was sensing to go in a specific chapter and a specific portion of scripture that deals with the person of Jesus Christ. And late last night, just sensed a different direction. Still in the book of Isaiah, but it's in a common chapter that most of us in here know. But we're just going to trust that even in this familiar scripture, that the Lord still has something fresh to say to us. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. It is in this chapter where the prophet Isaiah gives us, by the Holy Spirit, a detailed account of his encounter with the Lord of hosts. It's one of the most cherished portions of the Bible because it deals with a mere man coming face to face with the glory of God. We get a glimpse into another realm in this chapter. It's as though the Holy Spirit peels back the curtains of our flesh and peels back the curtains of time and allows us to get a little gaze into the keyhole of the throne room of God. This is real. This is not fairy tale. This is not something that we're just thinking is mystical. This is a real man who encountered a real God and was changed in a real way. And so Isaiah here wants to show us how he met with God. And as we read through this Bible, we realize that this glorious, radiant king that is described here is more specifically known as, according to John 12, 41, the person of Jesus Christ. That as we're about to read what Isaiah saw in all the splendor and majesty and blinding light, we realize that this same God is the same one who was born in a manger who grew up by earthly parents, who had no pillow in his name, and was ultimately condemned and criticized by sinful men. That same God that was spat upon by men was not even dared to be looked upon by seraphim, who closed their eyes with their wings, as we're about to read. And so as we are discovering Jesus Christ in the book of Isaiah, we are now going to see him high and lifted up. We are now going to see him gloriously displayed. And so we read in Isaiah 6, rather, verse 1, down to verse 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. 
the whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. Verse 7 says, And he had touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. This chapter is so rich with revelation, it's unbelievable. And though even in these past couple of weeks, we had two different speakers bring up Isaiah chapter 6, there is still even more to discover in this portion for us to glean from. Some might be reminders, some might be new, but as the saying goes, we have to hear even the same truth 10 times before it really gets into us. Verse 1 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Anybody know who King Uzziah is? King Uzziah, anybody familiar with him, with his reign, with his track record, with his endeavors? Anybody know? King Uzziah was somebody that was elected to be king at the age of 16 years old. He was raised up to fear God. He was raised up to seek the Lord his God all the days of his life. And he did so in the beginning of his reign. And when he did so, he prospered. And he prospered a lot. He reigned just over 50 years. And it gives us a detailed account in 2 Chronicles 26 of what this man accomplished throughout his time of leadership. He invented things. He took over land. He became famous. He conquered armies. There was such great prosperity and peace. I mean, if you wanted to live under a king amongst all the roster that we see in the book of First and Second Kings, King Uzziah was one of them, at least in the beginning. That was one guy that you wanted to sit under because there seemed to be this unusual favor upon his life and it spilled over to the people of Israel. But unfortunately, as we read in Second Chronicles 26, 21, you don't have to turn there, we're going to read it on the screen, Something unfortunately happened, and it unfortunately happens a lot even today, that when you get to a certain place, you begin to think that it's about you and it's no longer about God. and You begin to become really, really strong and independent apart from God's help, and that's when things get real messy. That's what happened to Uzziah. He assumed that he can walk into the temple and to burn incense as a priest when the law was so clear you can't do that even if you're a king. Unless you are a Levite, don't you dare step foot into the position that God has not called you into. But King Uzziah says to himself, surely this is proven in his action that God needs me. God can't do this without me. So let me do what I want. Let me run this show. And he does so. And as a result, leprosy breaks out on his forehead. And it tells us here in verse 21, And King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death. And being a leper, lived in a separate house, for he was excluded from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's household, governing the people of the land. Now look at the next verse. Now the rest of the acts of Uzziah, from first to last, Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, wrote. That tells me something about Isaiah and his relationship with Uzziah. At least something. Though it's not explicitly mentioned, there was something about Isaiah and his relationship with this king that for him to write the things that he did from the beginning to the end shows that he was familiar with this man. And it, Like I said, it doesn't say it, but perhaps this is true that Isaiah probably even counseled this king. Isaiah probably gave divine declarations to this king. Isaiah even maybe like Hezekiah, another king in another time, maybe even prayed with the man. All we can say, though, at this point is that Isaiah knew Uzziah. And Isaiah witnessed this man's downfall. And the question, just reading that verse and reading this text, thinking to myself, what did Isaiah feel as a result of this man's destruction? When, what went through his mind? What went through the mind of the people of Israel when their leader came crashing down head first? No pun intended. What, what did they sense? Everything about their hope, about their prosperity, about their peace, about their security was somewhat dependent upon this king, and now he's gone. 
Now he's off the scene. He's kicked off the throne. And this is when, according to Isaiah 6.1, God chooses to reveal himself to Isaiah. I find it interesting throughout this Bible how and when God chooses to manifest himself to his people. God's timing is not like our timing. You see throughout this book how God chooses to step on the scene and it seems to be usually a lot of the times when there is a low point. When there's a hopeless point. When there's a fog in the mind. When there's despair. When there's discouragement. When there's disappointment. God loves to show up in those moments. Which tells you and I something, does it not? Not to despise suffering. Not to despise trials. Not to despise dead-end moments in life. Think about Job. All the hell that this man has been through, physically, emotionally, mentally. And it wasn't until the end where he says in chapter 42, My, eye, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes see you. Think about Stephen. Just moments before, seconds before, he's about to be stoned by grown men for standing up for the truth of the gospel. And it is in that moment where he's about to face death, where the glory of God is revealed. Heaven is open and he sees Jesus Christ standing there honoring the man's martyrdom. And so the Bible gives you and I very strange language concerning suffering. It encourages us to embrace suffering, not just to embrace it and to acknowledge it, gritting our teeth. James says, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. What in the world? Count it all joy? So not just grit your teeth and clutch your fists, okay, here we go, but be joyful about it. And here's one thing that we can be joyful about, that surely in the midst of all of this craziness and chaos, God's going to show himself in a way that he couldn't otherwise. Is there losing in the Christian life? Only if you're outside of the will of God. But if you're walking with him hand in hand, know this, there is no losing in the Christian life. Never, even in suffering. And so it is the timing. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw, I saw, Something about God's glory. I saw something about his beauty and his majesty and his holiness. And it wasn't just that God wanted to reveal himself just to reveal himself. God wanted to teach Isaiah and not just Isaiah but the people of Israel. Not just the people of Israel but the people that are in this room in 2019. The same lesson that he's teaching here. There's something about the posture. There's something about what he saw. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord doing what? Sitting. Sitting upon a throne. You know what Jesus, according to John 12, wasn't doing? He wasn't pacing back on the marble floors of heaven nervous. It doesn't say that Jesus was sitting on the throne biting his nails, wondering what he's going to do because Uzziah messed up his program on the earth. It says he was sitting, which reveals something about his posture, which reveals something about what? His sovereignty. His authority, totally calm due to the wisdom that is unparalleled to anybody else's. So while Uzziah is kicked off the throne on the earth, there is another king in heaven who is completely still, unmoved and unshaken by what's happening down there because he's ultimately in control. So where do we look when things go chaotic in our lives? I'll tell you who's not nervous, your Lord and Savior. I'll tell you who's not anxious, your King and your God. I'll tell you who's not taken by surprise, the Lord of hosts. And this is where our eyes need to be. Not on Uzziah who, like other kings, come on and off. But the Lord of hosts who remains the same and remains strong. And remain steadfast. Not just over the nation of Israel, brother or sister. Over your life and mine. Over your life and mine is he sitting upon the throne. Knowing exactly what the next step is. When we can't see the next step. 
When we don't understand how things are going out of place, when we don't understand, I put my trust in this leader. This guy was our hope. He had such a, now what? What's the nation going to do? Who's the next king up in line? You can imagine the panic, and there is God saying, I'm in control. Isaiah, I want you as the messenger that represents me to see me in control, and would you pen it down by the Holy Spirit to let not just the people of Israel, but the rest of my people for the ages to come that I'm in control? He saw the Lord sitting on his throne. Psalms 2, 1 to 4. We're just going to read it on the screen. They're not just moments where God sits. Look at this. Why did the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. That's not a smart move, rulers. Against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, so here's the scene. Here's the prophetic imagery. That you have all the kings, all the leaders of the nations coming together. So in this scene, there's a king that's kicked off the throne. That's one thing. Now you have all these kings coming together, talking and counseling, and saying what? Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. And look what God does in response to these kings trying to plot against him. He who sits, oh, he's still sitting. He who sits in, hev- in the heavens laughs. The Lord, of, the Lord holds them in derig- derision. So whether a king is kicked off the throne, he's sitting. And whether kings are plotting against him, he's not just sitting, he's laughing. And it's a holy laughter. It's to say in that verse, you have no idea what you're up against. No matter how much power, might, wisdom you think you have, I'm the Lord of hosts. And we're going to uncover what that actually means. He saw the Lord sitting. He didn't just see that, though. It says, sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. We already discovered, according to Isaiah 52, what that means. That whoever that servant was in Isaiah 52 that would be high and lifted up is borrowing that language from this chapter, which tells us something about his person, that he's more than just a man. He's God. Sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. So these kings would wear these robes. And it would just simply display their glory. It would simply display their majesty. Even to some extent, some would believe would display, depending on the length, where they've been at and what kind of conquerors they've had, all these different things. But this robe about this king filled the temple. This was fascinating enough for Isaiah by the Spirit to pen it down and to record it. He saw this this, the hem of this king's robe literally filling the entire room. That says something. I think it does. Because if that robe represents glory and majesty, if it re- represents authority and power, it filled the entire temple. And I like to think that it filled the entire temple because it left no room for anybody else to dare try to bring glory into that place. You had Uzziah who came into the temple in 2 Chronicles 26, and tried to up himself up in the presence of God, failing to realize that God fills the temple with his glory, and he doesn't want to share it. And he never will share it. He wants every inch of attention, praise, and glory, and there's no room for anybody else. No room for anybody else. Nor will there ever be room for anybody else. And Isaiah noticed that, and he penned it down. This king takes it all. And then he goes to verse 2, and he, he begins to describe even more what he saw. There was room, but it was only room for worshipers. Verse 2 says, Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Now we, we heard this twice from two different speakers these past This past couple of weeks. These seraphim are these heavenly creatures. Some would say angels. Some would say not. Uh, We cannot assume that just because a description shows that there are wings on a creature that they're automatically an angel. Actually, you will find that angels don't have wings according to the Bible and contrary to popular belief. Angels are often mistaken to look like men. But these creatures have wings. And they're known as seraphim. They're identified as seraphim. And seraphim in the original simply means Burning ones. Burning ones. And so you can imagine, we don't know the number of these seraphim. We just know that there are some. And they're above the throne. They're they're there. 
and they are burning. There's a light, there's a glory, there's a glare, there's a, there's a lightness that's coming from these creatures. And so there's something about them that's so powerful in itself. And yet, as powerful as those creatures are, they cannot even barely contain the power that is radiating from the throne that they are facing. Think about that. And look at the posture. These seraphim, you and I are going to learn a lot from these seraphim. Because they stand in contrast with a lot of people in terms of how they look and relate to the Lord. Here are these seraphim, and it says here that they stood. And there stood the seraphim, which speaks of a posture ready to obey and ready to go and ready to do whatever this king says. We are at your service, Lord of hosts. That's what their posture is showing right there from the beginning. But it doesn't just end there. We heard this already. They had six wings. And they had two that covered their face. And yet two that covered their feet. This speaks of how they are responding in reverential awe. God-fearing. Awe and wonder. To this Lord of hosts. Those wings covering their feet in humility and in reverence. Speak of their worship. Speak of their worship towards this king. And yet there are two there that are flapping. There are two there that are working, so to speak, ready as they stand to move at his service. But see the emphasis. I and mean, this is what we heard. The emphasis here, two-thirds are for worship. One-third is for service. And this says something about what God asks of us, that there has to be devotion above ministry. That there must be a sense of adoration and communion, an intimate relationship with God above doing things for Him. Now, hypothetically speaking, if we all had six wings, if we were to all look at our energy level in our service to God and our relationship with God, how much of our energy level goes to worship and adoration? How much of it does it go to serving Him and doing things for Him? It's not that service is bad. It's not that service is unholy. It's not that service is not what God is looking for. It's that he wants the service to come from worship. And these seraphim are teaching us that. They're teaching us something. If we're honest with ourselves, how many of us are here Marthas and not Marys? Running around, running around, running around. And the Marthas complain about the Marys. You do nothing but sit at his feet. Come up and do some dishes. And she says, hold on, she's choosing the better portion. You realize that, right? See, I believe maybe part of the reason why we don't give our energy and our time to communion, I'm talking secret communion with God. Because we really don't see the benefit of it. We don't see immediate fruit out of it. We don't see something that's going to actually come out of this time with God. We fail to realize that it is the very source of becoming like him. As you and I behold him, we fail to realize that this is actually his primary desire from you and I. To spend time with him and to just give our attention enough where his holiness affects every facet of who we are. But when we serve, we see things. We, people recognize us. That's why a lot of people don't like to pray in private because nobody can recognize you. We pray in public, yeah. Preach. Oh, yeah. Pray in private. Well, nobody sees me, God. God sees you. But we don't believe God sees us. We don't believe God can speak to us. We don't believe that God actually can allow us to come into that close proximity of his presence where you go, I never knew my bedroom could become the holy of holies. These seraphim are teaching us that. Let's learn from the seraphim. How are the seraphim so in awe of their God? When angels will never share what you and I experience, they will never ever share. You know what? One thing that angels will never share with humans? The knowledge of forgiveness. Angels sing a lot, but I'll tell you what they can't sing. How the blood has redeemed them. And how they went from wicked, rebellious enemies of God to be adopted as sons and daughters. They will never know that joy, yet they still realize that God is worthy of their adoration and their attention and their love. And here we are, 
redeemed by the blood, saved by grace. Uh, we're appointed to a service to God in this world, and yet we fail to give God what these angels are giving God, these seraphim are giving God. And so there is an emphasis on worship. Listen to this verse in Song of Solomon, chapter 1. You don't have to turn there. If you want to turn there to make it a marker for your, for your heart, do so. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 6. Look what the young lady says in her relationship to the bridegroom, describing her life. She says, Do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were angry with me. Now look at this. This is crucial. They made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. They made me a keeper of their vineyards. But my own vineyard, I have not kept. You know what that speaks about? When people get so busy with other people's walk with the Lord, they neglect their own. When people who serve God get so busy with other people bearing fruit that they stop bearing fruit. That vineyard speaks about the luscious, fragrant relationship between God and man. And you and I can get so busy in ministry, so concerned with people's sanctification, so concerned that people will read their Bible, so concerned that they're going to pray and they're going to serve, that all for a sudden your own garden is getting dry. And your own vineyard is beginning to produce thorns and fruit is beginning to just get rotten and old and there's no life in it anymore. That's the great danger for those who want to serve God. And it is our responsibility... That as we keep other people's vineyards, whether you're on a ministry level in leadership or not, if you're just accountable to somebody else in life, that you in the process, don't convince yourself that just because I'm keeping other people's vineyards, God is happy. God wants your own vineyard to be kept. So then you can start the great temptation of many preachers. Start reading this Bible, and all you're doing is preparing sermons. And you're not letting him speak to you. It's your own heart. You can prepare worship songs and you don't even worship yourself. You're leading other people to worship. But your vineyard is dry. It's a dangerous possibility. And these angels, these seraphim, rather keep saying angels, forgive me, I mean seraphim. That God wants our devotion. But it's not just that. Oh, it goes even further. These seraphim that are worshiping. We've established that. They're worshiping. They're loving. They're adoring. But consider also the timing of their worship as well. That these creatures, although King Uzziah died, they still thought that God was worthy of worship. They weren't distracted. They weren't discouraged. They weren't unmotivated. And that could possibly be the heart posture of many of the people of Israel, including Isaiah himself. And yet Isaiah, in the same year that King Uzziah died, is seeing that these creatures are preoccupied with undivided worship to God. Because God is worthy of our praise and love no matter what happens in this world, whether it's globally or personally. He is worthy for us to still say, you're still the king. And you're still on your throne. And you're still holy. And you're still lovely. And you're still in control. No matter what. These seraphim. What are they teaching us? Very much up to this point. And now these seraphim. Do something else. This is fascinating. Because the idea from this familiar passage is that. When it comes to verse 3. It says, one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And this is how it often goes. These angels do not stop worshiping God. They don't stop acknowledging God's holiness. You go to Revelations and you realize that hundreds and hundreds of years later, the creatures are still saying the same thing. Holy, 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 holy. And though God is receiving praise from these creatures... Do we realize when we read this slowly that he is not directly receiving that praise from them? Do we realize that he is not the targeted object of their expression? What does the Bible say? They said to one another. They said to one another, holy. So Isaiah is watching. 
And you know what he's not seeing? He's not seeing them all focus on the Lord of hosts and saying, holy, 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 though that is true. They're in the presence of God. They're actually talking to one another. And they're saying to one another, God is holy. God is holy. God is holy, the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is filled with his glory. And he's going, these seraphim are acknowledging and they're expressing and they're declaring to one another of something of the character, nature, and the power of God. And I thought to myself when reading this, for the longest time I thought they were saying it directly to God, but now I'm realizing that they're saying it to one another. Why? This is why. Because the byproduct of being in the presence of God and stationing yourself to adore and to behold Him is that you can stop talking about Him to others. That as a result of me seeing Him, cherishing Him, being impacted by what I am being exposed to, it's not that I'm just going to worship him. I'm going to talk to others about how awesome he is. Because I can't contain it. I can't hold it in. I've seen too much. I've heard too much. I've been impacted too much. To not be able to let this joy and this power and this holiness of my God bubble up outside of me and say, Do you realize how holy he is? Do you realize that the whole earth is filled with his glory? Hey, you know what we're going to be doing in heaven? We're going to be talking about Jesus. Listen very carefully. What are we going to do in glory? In the very presence of God, are they talking about God? If you can't talk about Jesus now in terms of fellowship and communion with your brother and sister, I'm telling you, I've sat in rooms after conferences, meetings, whatever it is, and in time of fellowship, it seems like these Christians can talk about anything and everything. The moment you bring up God, it's like they lose their breath. It's like, hold on, God. And it gets awkward. It gets awkward. The moment you bring up Jesus, I'm talking church. I'm not talking about the streets. I'm talking after a meeting. You're talking about Jesus to other people. What's God done in your life? What's your testimony? What's God been showing you in the scriptures? What has God been dealing with in your heart? Oh, you can talk about anything else and their eyes light up. And the seraphim teach us something. When you're really in the presence of God, When you really spend time with him, when you really have seen him, there's an ease to talk about him. There's a desire to talk about him. There's a longing to talk about him. So they're there, worshiping God, ready for his service, and talking to one another about his glory. That's convicting. It's not just the subject of heaven. It's the subject of those who converse with one another, who daily ask God to get another glimpse of who he is. What do these seraphims speak exactly? It says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, his character. And secondly, the whole earth is full of his glory, his works. His character, his works. This is what they wanted to talk about. This is what consumed them. This is what was on their hearts. Surely they were burning ones, not just in the physical manifestation. They were burning for God. They were burning for God. All the way to the point where how they related to one another. So you have holy, holy, holy. You have this triple emphasis. That saying that God was holy once wasn't enough. He is holy, holy, holy. There's no one like him. This is what they're saying to you. God is above everything and everyone else. God is transcendent. He is distinct. He is surely high and lifted up. And they are discussing with one another for all eternity how there is no one like this God. There's no one as beautiful as him. There's no one as compassionate as him. There's no one as forgiving as him. There's no one as powerful. There's no one as just as him. His nature, his character is above every creature. Every person, everything in this life can't even come close to him. So what they talked about was his nature. What they talked about as they discovered continually of how great he is, they shared that with one another. Do we? 
Is there anything about our relationship with God where we discover something about him? Even if it's just a, a simple revelation where we want to share it. I'm not talking about evangelizing, guys. I'm not talking about witnessing to the world. I'm talking about just the bubbling overflow of a road to Emmaus conversation where our hearts burn within us because we've allowed God to burn in our hearts. The Lord of hosts. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Lord of hosts simply means the Lord of angel armies. The Lord of angel armies. And that compound title, the Lord of hosts, is found most in the prophetic books. All these prophets love to use the title Lord of hosts. And why was that? It's because of what these prophets had to deal with. Their people continually being defeated by an enemy because of their own sinfulness. Their people continually losing battles and being kidnapped and being exiled. And, and so they would use the term Lord of hosts when they spoke on behalf of God. He's the Lord of hosts. Saying what? Meaning what? That no matter how much you fail as an army, no matter how much your leadership over and over again crashes, there is a God who will fight for you. There's a God who's able to deliver you. There's a God who's willing to go before you. There's a God that no matter how big your enemy is, is willing and able to conquer if you're willing to partner with him. And so you know what else these angels are talking about? Not just about his character and his nature. They were talking about the potential and what God can do as the Lord of hosts. This was the subject of conversation. God can do anything. Nothing is impossible for our God. God is willing to do so much. And this consumed their speech. And not just that. It says the whole earth is full of his glory. So they recognize even this as seraphim in another world. That as they saw the earth, as they realized what God's dealings was in the world. There is something about a current display of God's glory that is real. And there is something about a permanence of God's glory that will be real later on. That in the millennial reign, the glory of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. But, there's a current glory. There's something now where the earth is full of his glory, declares the glory of God, and they love to talk about it. How is the earth filled with the glory of God now? Any idea? Why don't we put it up? Exactly. Psalms 19, 1 and 4. 1 and 2, rather. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Verse 2. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. You know the stars say something? You know those clouds when they form in a specific sunset, they're saying something? They're saying God is glorious. God is the author. God is the mind behind all that you see and all the things that take your breath away and all the things that you saw on your vacation and what you did on your road trip, that was all God. The whole earth is filled with the glory of God. Not just creation, though. We can spend moments in that. But Colossians 1.27 tells us that the gospel itself among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of the mystery of God. You realize that? That there's another facet of the glory of God in this world right now that is being manifested, and it's this. That salvation doesn't just belong to the Jews. Salvation belongs to all men everywhere, every nation. And that shows the glory of God. The mystery of the gospel is that all men can become children of God. And so as the gospel is being preached, and as people respond to the gospel, God's glory is being manifested. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Oh, there are so many other ways, and here's another one. Jesus said it in John 15, 8. By this, my Father is glorified. John 15, 8. By this, my Father is glorified. How else is the world filled with the glory of God? That you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Yes, creation. Obviously creation. Every jagged mountain with the snow peak mountain. Every beautiful field, every roar of the ocean waves, all of that declares the glory of God. When the gospel goes forth and hearts are converted, the glory of God. And when you and I bear fruit, a fragrance arises in the world and it points to the glory of God. 
So these seraphim, collectively, you know what the, you know what consumed them because they were in the presence of God. The character and the nature of God. What God is able to do and what God has already and is currently doing. They were consumed by this. You might be thinking, well, these are seraphim. They couldn't stop talking about it because they're seraphim. That's not what Peter said. When they made it a law that Peter and, and the boys could not preach, Acts 4, 19 and 20 tells us what they were experiencing in their hearts. Listen to this. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. Here it is. This is so powerful. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. We can't help it. So it's not just seraphim. It's born again Christians. If you talk in the name of Jesus again, we're going to punish you. And this is Peter and John's response. Hold up. We can't help it. Like, we get it's a law. But something else happened to us. We've seen too much. And we've heard too much. Where I can't help but joyfully speak about him. In this context is evangelism. I'm sure it was true in fellowship. And I wonder if the reason why so many people don't speak is because they haven't seen or heard anything. That must be it. Maybe your love for Christ, even in the context of your fellowship with others, has become very foreign lately because, here's the question, when was the last time you've seen or heard something? I'm not asking when the last time you came to church. No, no, no. When was the last time you saw and heard something of the glory of God as a result of posturing yourself to worship and adore him? It's the byproduct. It's not the means. You and I don't have to work up this spirituality to show people we're spiritual. Just get alone with him and watch what will happen to your speech. Just spend some time with him. Watch what's going to happen to your face, never mind your words. These men have been with Jesus. That's what the Pharisees came to the conclusion. These men had been with Jesus. And so the seraphim and the church, the early church, teach us something that when you see and when you hear, you can't help but speak. And so it doesn't become legalistic effort. It doesn't become impressing language. No, it doesn't become any of that stuff. It becomes raw, real relationship with Christ that affects your mouth itself. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Verse 4 tells us something else that Isaiah experienced. And the foundation of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. So here's the scene. Here's this glorious, majestic king sitting high and lifted up. And the train of his robe is filling the temple. And you've got these seraphim, these glorious creatures that have six wings that are covering their face, covering their feet, and, and saying to one another how holy this God is. And all the while, this unbelievable sight is before him. The, earth, the, the, the floor, the thresholds, and the posts of the door begin to shake. And it is at this point where Isaiah cannot contain it, and he now bursts forth in personal confession. And he says what? Verse 5. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. In the ESV, it says lost. King James, New King James says undone. The root word for when Isaiah said, I am lost, is actually the word destroyed. Woe is me, for I am destroyed. This is a man as a prophet. See, this is so strange in the placement of this chapter. Some would even say that this is not chronological. This is actually when Isaiah was first commissioned as a prophet. And there's a debate around, is this when Isaiah was commissioned or is this Isaiah mid-ministry? I lean on that side more. 
This is Isaiah as a prophet, as a minister. And here he is coming into the presence of God as a vessel for God. And he dare not even bring forth one righteous deed. But he felt like he was going to literally be crumbled on the weight of conviction. And what's amazing is the language he uses. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. You know what's fascinating is that that word unclean is used for lepers. That description for a person to put on himself or to put on another, man, a leper, if he was a leper, had to walk around the camp saying, unclean, unclean, unclean. And here's Isaiah using that same terminology in terms of his speech, which goes even deeper than that because that was Uzziah's condemnation. Uzziah became a leper. Uzziah was unclean. And in the presence of God, Isaiah leveled himself to the same plane as Uzziah. That as much as Uzziah royally failed, and Isaiah was the one who recorded his failures, in the presence of God, he put himself on the same level as Uzziah. I'm unclean. And on top of that, he puts the whole nation under that. We're all unclean. Because whatever Uzziah had physically as a leper, Isaiah knew to be true spiritually. I'm filthy. I'm damaged. I'm a sinner. I have no right to be in the presence of God and even live. I'm not better than Uzziah. I'm not better than the nation of Israel. And the reason why Isaiah could see his own sinfulness is because he saw the king of glory. See, when we compare ourselves to other people, we're not so bad, are we? In fact, we use that as a means to justify our silliness and stupidity. I'm not as dumb as that guy. And I didn't go as far with drugs as that guy. And I didn't go as far with my money as that girl. Now put your life in the face of the king of glory. And like Isaiah, before you confess the sins of others, you're going to confess your own. I'm going to confess my own. His sin came into full view because he came into the presence of God. I can tell you what will keep you and I humble throughout this walk, like Isaiah became humble through his walk. When you and I choose to get into the presence of God and allow him as we spend time with him to show us our sin. But here's the important thing. Isaiah was about to be commissioned by God. Listen, if you want to be used by God, this is the time to say, okay, Isaiah was about to be commissioned by God to serve God, yet it was this process that first needed to come about in order for him to do so. Before Isaiah as a preacher can go out and say, hey, sinners, get right with God, Isaiah first needed to see himself as a sinner. Before he would tell other people their need for the grace of God, Isaiah himself needed to realize his need for the grace of God. And this would bring about an anchor of humility to Isaiah. And this is the great need for all of us if we want to be used by God and be safe from pride and arrogance. Lord, show me my own sinfulness. Show me my own fallenness. Show me that I'm capable of doing just as much as Uzziah did before I dare go out and tell other people their need of you. Isn't that amazing? Because it wasn't just Isaiah. Remember Moses? When Moses was called to go out and deliver the nation of Israel, God had provided Moses some signs to give to the people of Israel to confirm that he was truly chosen by God. And here is one of them. After the sign of catching his rod, which became a snake by the tail, you go to Exodus 4.4 and let's read what happened here. Exodus 4.4 is one of the other signs that God gave to Moses to give to the people of Israel. The Lord said to Moses, put your hand... This is afterwards, you can go to verse 5. And that they may believe the, the Lord, that, that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to them, put your hand inside your cloak. This is the second sign. And he put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. So there's many applications to this, but here's one message. Moses, the servant of God, Moses, the representative of God, what God just showed him here was, Moses, you can become a leper too. Moses, in a moment, you can become cut off as well. It can happen to you, Moses. 
As he put his hand inside his cloak, what, what, a, what a posture, what a picture there, that really inside Moses, you're just as much as a sinner in need of grace as the people that you're going to minister in a moment. Then he told him to put his hand back in and pull it out, and it would be like all his flesh again. So you have Isaiah, you have Moses that needed a revelation of their own neediness before they can go and tell others of theirs. It's a beautiful picture of humility. And then what happens here? Because guess what? As much as this man felt like he was going to be destroyed, that is not where God wants you and I to stay. That overwhelming sense of guilt, that overwhelming sense of realization that I'm not worthy to be in the presence of God, God doesn't want you and I to stay there. That's not his goal to keep us like that in a fetal position, wanting to die rather than be before him. That is the beginning. That is the necessary step to experience the next step that God wants us to remain in. And this is what Isaiah is about to experience right now. It says here, that as he's standing before the throne, which represents the holiness of God, he now beholds something else, which is an angel or a seraphim who comes and takes a coal from the altar to put it on his lips. And that altar represents the forgiveness of God. See, it's one thing to behold the throne, which is totally necessary, but not in the absence of looking at that altar, which represents forgiveness and atonement. And that's what, that's what Isaiah is about to experience now. In light of the holiness of God, he's about to experience the mercy of God. And now he comes to a place where he says, one of these seraphim, this is beautiful, comes and he takes a coal with tongs and he puts it on my lips to atone for my sin. Now, this is Isaiah's perspective. I want, I want us to just come to the seraphim's perspective. Here's the seraphim who stands in the presence of God who worships God, who loves God, who adores God. And I believe here, this simple move of this seraphim teaches us something about one who truly claims to know God and to know his presence. That if you and I claim to spend time with God, if you and I claim to be intimate with God, to realize his holiness is our ambition, that will somewhat be proven on how we treat those who are in sin. Here's a man who's confessing humbly his own brokenness and his own neediness. And here's this seraphim responding to that man with compassion, with grace, and with a message. God can forgive you. God can forgive you. See, our vertical with God is somewhat shown in our horizontal with people. And not just those who spend time with God as well but with those who realize their need of God, for those who realize their hypocrisy, for those who realize their inconsistency, even those who spend time with God, do not look at such a person and say, oh, look, get out of here. God's going to crush you. Get out of here. You're not worthy. No, let me come and let me provide you a coal. Let me provide you a remedy for you to be able to stand in the presence of God. Those who spend time with God ultimately reflect God, are gentle like Jesus, are compassionate, are merciful, are extending in mercy. Holiness is not evident through harsh criticism and judgment. Actually, it's quite the contrary. He offered the source of atonement in the state of this man's humiliation, a seraphim who stood in the presence of God. And he took this coal, he presses it upon the lips of Isaiah. That's burning. Isaiah says, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I'm amongst a people of unclean lips. We don't know what Isaiah said or why he came to that conclusion. But this was his main problem, my lips. My lips are my problem. My lips are the very thing that I keep falling into sin with. And I need something to come and to cleanse. And God knows exactly what it's going to take. It's going to take him power to purge it out. And we need to be willing. Listen, we need to be willing. If we want to be cleansed by God, to stay still, to humbly confess it, and to let him burn it out as much as it burns. This is ultimately for our good. Consume it, Lord. Take over it, Lord. Let it be completely raptured. Let it be completely evaporated. However long you need to keep that coal on my lips, let it be pressed until they are clean. 
this is, I believe, one of the most exciting parts. Is after this coal was pressed upon his lips and he had received atonement. That seraphim says, your sins have been atoned for. Look what happens in verse 9. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? We're concluding here. Realize the progression here. Realize the sequence. That Isaiah was able to hear the Lord at this point only after his cleansing. It was only after Isaiah was atoned for. It was only after his sin was purged out. It was only until he was able to say, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I'm amongst the people of unclean lips, and to stay steady enough for God to deal with his sin. And as a result of that, something happened with his ears. He's now able to hear, listen to this, he is now able to hear the Lord, which is Jesus Christ, speaking to the other persons of the triune God. What a beautiful byproduct of confession, repentance, turning from sin, and even salvation itself. Because here's the truth. You and I can't hold on to our sin. You and I can't acknowledge something that's wrong with us, that's outside of the will of God, and not do something about it and expect to hear God's voice. It won't happen. It's only until we allow ourselves to be purged and to be cleansed. Lord, whatever you need to burn out of my life, where something happens, like how was it? Was it Isaiah? Was he become? Was he nearer to God? Was God's loud voice clearer? What, what does it matter? The principle is still true that there is a nearness of God that comes as a result of confessing our sins and wanting to walk away from it. What a motivation for holiness! Now, if you don't want God to be near to you, and you don't want God's voice to be clear to you, and you don't want to commune with Him like Isaiah's commune, like He's hearing God. I'm not saying that you're going to hear God audibly, okay? It's the principle. Where God becomes real to you as a result of saying, Lord, I want to be in your presence, and I know you can't have sin, so I say no to my sin. If that doesn't motivate you, good luck. I don't know what else would be a motivation. What else can be a greater motivation than me coming closer to God, me coming into this relationship and proximity to him in which I really hear him? Is compromise really worth it? What high can drug give you, drugs give you compared to that? What thrill can any sexual tryst offer compared to that? What amount of money? Put the number down and let's see what amount of money can compare to the joy and the thrill of hearing the Godhead being real in your life. The greatest fight against sin is a greater intimacy with God. If that is not the motivation of your sin, you will stay bound. You will stay bound. It's just the reality of it. But when we say no, we are invited into something more glorious than we can ever imagine. And guess what? When you come into that place of glory with God, it's going to be very hard for you to turn back. And when you do, because we do make mistakes and we do make faults. Yes, it happens. We realize what is forfeited. Our ears begin to get dull. Our senses to his conviction, our senses of his comfort and his presence begin to get numb. Oh, Lord, whatever I need to do to make sure that I can regain and remain in that state, put a burning coal on my lip again. He's willing to do it. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. You know what I love about Isaiah's voluntary acceptance to this? He didn't even know what the task was. It wasn't like God gave the detailed description like he's about to give to Isaiah. God just says, we're looking for someone. And that was enough for Isaiah to say, sign me up. Sign me up. All right, Isaiah. This is what your ministry is going to look like. To the world, a failure. But this teaches us something about Isaiah. This teaches us something about how we relate to God. Why would Isaiah so quickly volunteer himself to something that he did not even know? It's because of what he experienced prior to it. 
When you know the forgiveness, the atoning work of Jesus Christ upon your life, you will be willing to do whatever he asks of you. Whatever he says, at whatever cost, there will be a joy to say, here I am, send me. Whatever it takes for me to walk in obedience to you, as a result of you cleansing me, you have my life. So Isaiah didn't pull out his resume and say, Lord, this is what I'm looking to do. And if you don't use me in this way, then I'm just, you're not worthy of my service. Now Isaiah experienced too much in this moment where he said, he hears God. He, communion, right? He's hearing God. He, he gets a glimpse into the conversation within the Godhead. And then they go, who, who's, who can we send to serve us? And Isaiah goes, here I am, send me. Whatever you ask of me, Lord, I will do it. And he probably took on one of the greatest tasks of a prophet to preach to people who will never listen or change. Can you imagine? All the sermon prep for what? All the praying for what? But oh, when you do it for him. And oh, when you realize what he's done for you and what he's done for me. No matter what he asks, no matter what he has in mind, to say, here I am, send me, is the true response to the person who's experienced the cleansing work of that call who is ultimately Jesus Christ. And you know what God does? In verse 9, and he said, go and say to this people. And we won't even get into that. We don't have enough time to talk about how this was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus' ministry. But the principle is this, that when Isaiah volunteered himself, to God's service, God did not use Isaiah's past against them to say, you can't serve me. He didn't say, well, weren't you just in admitting that you're a man of unclean lips? Like, you're a man of unclean lips, so you know what task I'm going to give you? Preach. You know, it's not like you're a man of unclean lips, so you have a bad reputation, and you might get back into this cycle again, so go and do something else with your hands. He puts him into a, a task that directly deals with what his problem was. Go preach for me. But you don't understand, I'm a man of unclean lips. No, no, no. I'm not holding your past against you. You confessed and you've been cleansed. Now go and serve me. Oftentimes, we will use our own past as an excuse for God not to use us. And God is more than willing, more than willing to use us in ways that you cannot even imagine. And God has the type of sense of humor to use you in a specific way that you served the devil with before. You use your money to serve the devil and advance his kingdom. So I'm going to bless you with money. Now you're going to use it to advance my kingdom. It's like, Lord, what? You slandered, you judged, you got whatever you did with your lips. Now I'm going to make you a preacher. It's just amazing what God is willing to do. And God did not use Isaiah's past against him. In fact, I believe for the glory of God, he used him in that direct way to show how forgiving and loving he is. So many truths from this chapter. I know this was more of a message than a Bible study, but... Praying into this, thinking, Lord, just let us get a glimpse tonight of Jesus Christ high and lifted up. And Lord, help us believe that you're willing to use us no matter where we've messed up. That in this moment tonight, this is the call tonight. That in this moment tonight, you, there's some new faces here. God bless you. We're so glad that you're here. God wants to use your life more than you can imagine. But notice the progression in Isaiah's testimony here. Realize this. It started with conviction. It started with conviction. Then it resulted in confession. And after confession came commission. Conviction. Confession. Commission. If you and I want to be used by God, and in this day of hour, trust me, God is looking for people that will go where he wants them to go. I'm not saying that in preacher motivational speech. It's a real deal. There's something about our generation where there seems to be a very great lack. Trust me in that. There's a great lack 
of zealous followers of Jesus Christ. And it's a scary thing to see, but we're just trusting that Jesus is still on his throne. Especially in the West, a growing coldness seems to be simmering and blanketing over our generation. It doesn't seem like conferences are working anymore. It doesn't seem like big names are doing anything. In fact, we're hearing about the big names falling. Like one after the other, like flies, it seems. God help us. And this is what we need more than anything. A willingness to say, Lord, I, want, I need you to expose yourself to me in such a way where I realize my need of you. And I need you to touch my life with your coal. And Lord, don't just stop there. Cleanse whatever you need to cleanse out of my life. And I want to go where you want me to go. This is the Bible study call tonight. For that to be responded to. And you would be amazed how God can use a person in this place like they never thought or imagined. And maybe you have been in that place, but now you've grown cold. So here's another question. When was the last time you've seen or heard something from him that would cause your heart to come so alive where you effortlessly, whether it's speaking to others that don't know about him or speaking to those who do know about him, as an overflow of love? Peter says, we can't help but speak of what we've seen and heard. That is the solution for that dryness in your soul to become moist again. Lord, let me see something and let me hear something from your word in your presence and prayer. Touch me again so that I can represent you well again.